Welcome. Uh, my name is Joe Kim, and I'm the director of the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program here at McMaster University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that McMaster University sits on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands acknowledged by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Welcome everyone on Valentine's Day. I can't think of a more romantic thing to do than to be intellectually stimulated. Um, before we get started, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, if you need to use uh, restrooms, they're just one floor below. There's an elevator just uh, right over there. Um, and um, before we begin with our first presenter, I'm pleased to welcome a special guest to the podium. She's been the champion of our postdoc training program since it began in 2019. And on the topic of postdocs, she completed her postdoctor fellowships in kinesiology and exercise science at the University of British Columbia and Western University. Please join me in welcoming McMaster's Dean of Science, Dr. Maureen McDonald. Thanks, Joe, and welcome, everyone. It's wonderful and fitting to see you here on Valentine's Day, although I think I got the memo about what color to wear and Joe didn't. He said he doesn't own anything red. Uh, tonight, we're listening to six brilliant researchers speak about the work they love. With each of them only speaking 10 minutes, we're basically going to call this a scientific speed dating event. I'm so proud of what this program has accomplished in the last five years. The McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program has established itself as the preeminent postdoctoral training program in Canada. And tonight's event will offer all of you a glimpse into the postdoctoral community and this program it's building across Canada. On behalf of McMaster University and the Faculty of Science, I want to thank the people who have helped make this possible. Marcy and John McCall McBain are true visionaries who are immensely committed to building the next generation of teachers and leaders. Not to mention, we are incredibly proud of Marcy, who is a McMaster alumnus from the class of 2000. To all of those at the McCall McBain Foundation, Thank you for your unrelenting support and partnership. If you've been following the narrative with respect to higher education and the fiscal challenges, people like John and Marcy are more important than ever in helping us advance these important priorities. And thank you especially to Joe and Katie and the many collaborators at McMaster who've put in many hours into building and teaching a curriculum that challenges and grows these fellows. I also want to mention that we are excited that three McMaster undergraduate students were recently listed as finalists for another program that is being supported by the McCall McBain Foundation. This is the McCall McBain Scholarships. Two of these students are studying integrated science in the Faculty of Science at McMaster. So we wish them well in this next stage of that competition, as they will soon be traveling to Montreal to interview for the scholarship final awards. And that award is a fully funded master's or professional degree with mentorship, coaching, and leadership training all embedded in that program at McGill University. It's an incredible opportunity and we're excited to see more McMaster students growing from the McCall McBain Foundation's leadership. Before I hand the mic over, I want to thank all of the fellows with us tonight for their hard work in preparing and delivering these presentations. And I want to thank Dr. Derek Somo for representing the current cohort of McCall McBain uh, Fellows at McMaster University, and Dr. Jeremy Marty Dugas for representing the, fellow, the program's amazing alumni. One of the efforts we're making is to track the alumni of the program to see about the impact on the program on their professional uh, careers. To the others who have joined us from outside of Hamilton, welcome to McMaster, and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you to everyone for coming with us, whether you're here in person or online, and please enjoy the evening. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to advance the slides a little bit here. There we go. Welcome. 
so thank you, Dean McDonald, uh, for that great introduction. My name is Katie George, and I am the program manager for the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program, which is a mouthful to say. Um, I want to welcome everyone to what promises to be an absolutely amazing evening. I hope you enjoyed some delicious food, and now you get to enjoy some appetizers for your mind, as it was, yes? Um, so this evening, we will have the privilege of hearing from six elite researchers who are seated up here. You will see them one by one come up and do their 10-minute talk. These, <coughs> pardon me, uh, they're the finalists from the McCall McBain 10-minute research talks, which included over 21 researchers from across Canada. So you have the top spots sitting in front of you tonight. Uh, they were tasked to translate their complex research, which you will see, into a 10-minute talk for an interdisciplinary audience, which I promise you is no small feat. It is absolutely challenging, and they've done an amazing job, as you will see. At the end of the evening, we will have a brief question and answer period, so I ask that you hold all of your questions until that time. I've provided notepads and pens so that as the speakers are talking, if something sort of percolates in your mind, you can write it down and save it to the end, okay? Uh, you will also have the opportunity to vote for your favorite talks, both online as well as our in-person audience. You've all been provided with a QR code, so after the talks, please go on. Uh, in that question and answer period, you will be able to vote. Uh, so again, keep track of the talks, keep track of who's your favorite and which one you enjoy the most. All right, um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So, Dr. Ruth Rifkin, could you please come up to the podium? So, Dr. Ruth Rifkin is from the University of Manitoba. Dr. Rifkin is a proudly, uh, broadly trained evolutionary ecologist whose research focuses on the uh, interface between global environmental change, ecology, evolution, and conservation genetics. Tonight, she will speak about her research in which she studies the genomic evolution of polar bears to better understand the impacts of climate change on their capacity for adaptation. Dr. Rivkin grew up in Newfoundland and became interested in studying polar bears when one actually floated down to St. John's on an iceberg, no less, got stuck halfway up a cliff, and had to be airlifted back to safety. Pretty exciting stuff when you're just a kid, right? Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruth Rivkin. everyone. Thank you for that very nice introduction. That was very kind. I'm just going to check that my remote works. It does. So um, as Katie mentioned, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of my work about um, how and when and where polar bears might be able to adapt to climate change. Got a little bit of feedback. Hopefully that's a little less hard on the ears. Okay. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. 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 Postdoctoral research fellow. I work collaboratively with Polar Bears International, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, and Environment Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of my research on adaptation in polar bears um, from a genetics perspective. So that's quite a bit of a mouthful. So I'd like to start by just going through some of the basics of polar bear biology. So polar bears are found across the Arctic. There's approximately 20 to 25,000 polar bears worldwide. They're broken into 19 populations. You can see them outlined here. And Canada actually has two thirds of all polar bears in the world. And so what that means is that our country has a significant role to play in the conservation and management of polar bears. Sea ice, as you are probably aware, is very important to polar bears. Uh, mating occurs on the ice, and once mating has happened, polar bear females will find a den, they'll spend two to three months in there, and then they'll care for their cubs for about three years. And this requires that they hunt all of the food for their cubs and teach them all about hunting seals. 
because seals are the primary prey source of polar bears. They mostly rely on ringed and bearded seals. And how they access their food is they will find a lair under the ice, they'll punch through the ice, take a seal pup, and eat most of the blubber off the seals. This is probably 95% of their diet. They will also eat harbor seals, walrus, and sometimes they'll take a beluga. But for the most part, all of their feeding occurs on the ice. When polar bears are not on the ice, when the sea ice melts in the summer, they typically don't eat. They will and have been known to scavenge. A couple of them have been documented to take caribou. And sometimes they'll get into a town dump. Uh, the town of Churchill, Manitoba, which is where I do my research, has a polar bear jail for polar bears that get into the dump one too many times. But for the most part, if polar bears are on land, they're fasting. And when they're fasting, they will lose up to a kilogram of body weight per day until they make it back on the ice. So polar bears, as you can imagine, are extremely well adapted to life on the sea ice. Adaptations are evolved changes in physical or genetic traits that lead to an increase in either survival or reproduction. So polar bears that are adapted to sea ice are ones that survive better or produce more cubs. You can think of adaptations like the big teeth that polar bears have to eat through thick seal hide, their big fuzzy paws that help them walk on sea ice, and of course, their iconic white or translucent fur that helps them blend into that sea ice landscape. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that sea ice is essential for polar bears. And that brings us to our problem. Climate change is leading to warming across the world, but it's happening at a pace that is much faster in the Arctic. Here, I'm showing you the North Pole in 1979, and I'm just gonna outline the extent of the sea ice in red here. I'm gonna show you the same spot in 2022 and keep that outline. And so what you can see is that we've lost almost a third of the sea ice in the Arctic. And this poses a significant challenge for polar bears. We know that sea ice loss is harmful for bears. When they're not on the sea ice, they can't hunt their primary prey source. They have to go through longer fasting periods. And this is really tough for cubs that are smaller and have less mass to lose. They're also more likely to be exposed to disease and pollution as warming is increasing the amount of pathogens that are coming out of the ice and the permafrost. And they're getting into conflict with humans, which you can probably imagine from the polar bear jail that almost always has one or two occupants. So all of this is, all of this leads to negative effects for polar bears. So I was interested in understanding if polar bears could adapt to sea ice loss. Now, my PhD was, was answering questions like this, but I was working with plants. And for plants, you take a bunch of, bunch of them, you grow them in a, in a greenhouse, and you see which survives better, which has more offspring. You can't do that with polar bears. It's, uh, they're, they're, they won't cooperate with that. So instead, we took a genetic perspective. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some genetic terms, specifically alleles. Alleles are a variable sequence of DNA at a particular location in the genome. You can think of this as a unit of variation. And so bears that have more alleles are ones that have more genetic diversity. Bears with fewer alleles have lower genetic diversity. And this is important because we can use genetic diversity to assess bears' capacity for adaptation. And how we do that looks a little bit like this. Let's say we have some sea ice loss and we've got three different types of bears. The blue genetic background bear, produces four cubs, the yellow genetic background bear produces three cubs, and the red only produces one. We can scan the Arctic and look for different DNA sequences that might correspond to bears that have more or fewer cubs to assess whether or not they're likely to be ad adapting to climate change. And this operates on the premise that genetic diversity is essential for adaptation. Let's say we have sea ice loss here on the x-axis ax and um, some kind of physical or genetic trait on the y-axis. An adaptation would be something that shifts polar bears from green to orange. And this allows them to survive better, cope with sea ice loss. The rate and likelihood of that adaptation takes, taking place relies on how much genetic variation is in that polar bear population. 
Genetic variation provides the raw material for adaptations to take place. So if you have more genetic diversity, you're just more likely to be able to adapt. Whereas if you have less genetic diversity, you're more likely to be maladapted or unable to adapt. And so what we did was we scanned 13 of the populations in Canada and we looked at how much genetic diversity was in those populations. And what we found looks a little bit like this. So I have population here shown by these codes, which correspond to these 13 populations here. On the uh, y-axis, I have genetic diversity. And what I want you to notice is that it's these six populations here that correspond to the northern Arctic, the high Arctic, that have the lowest genetic diversity. And so this suggests that these populations are the ones that are least likely to adapt. We decided to take this one step further, and we scanned for hotspots of maladaptation across the Arctic. Um, what you do to do these scans, you take some alleles, and you map them across an environmental gradient. Here, we're looking at sea ice thickness or sea ice loss. You then take climate models that predict future changes in sea ice condition under different warming scenarios. So here we looked at the climate scenario for 2100. And you can use machine learning to combine these to predict how much polar bear populations are likely to shift in their allele frequencies under this new environment. And here, what we're assuming is that po populations that have to big make a bigger shift are ones that are more likely to be maladapted because they have to go farther in order to adapt. We found that consistent with our results in, on genetic diversity, it was the northern polar bears that were most at risk of maladaptation. So here I'm showing you a map of our um, study area. And these circles here show the polar bears. Bears that have a higher risk of maladaptation are the ones shown with the warmer colors. And you can see they're almost all clustered in the north of the Arctic. But what I do want to point out is that all bears had to go through some degree of shift in order to cope with climate change. And so what this suggests is that while bears in the north are most likely to be maladapted, all polar bears in the Canadian Arctic are going to face challenges in coping with sea ice loss. So some of you might be asking, well, what about hybridization with grizzly bears? Grizzly bears can cope with warmer climates. They're very closely related to polar bears. Can they hybridize to make growler bears? And this is a picture of a growler bear um, from one of the zoos. You can see they're really cute. They're fuzzy. They're brown, little brown. Um, and so we were interested in looking at how often hybridization might occur. In the wild, in Canada, we have 10 known instances of polar bears, they're, of growler bears, sorry. They're very easy to identify because they have a big stripe down their back. But we wanted to know, are there any hidden hybrids? So we scanned about 900 bears across the Arctic. And it turns out we're actually really good at finding hybrids. We didn't find any other cases of hybridization. And so what this suggests is that hybridization is not a viable avenue for adaptation for polar bears. So to circle back to my original question, can polar bears adapt to sea ice loss? doesn't look like they have a good chance of being able to do so. There might be some regions of the Arctic that might be better suited to warming climates, but overall, we're going to see significant challenges for polar bears in the coming years. And so what we should be doing is focusing on preserving the remaining sea ice habitat and trying to reduce emissions as much as possible to lower how much warming the environment is going to experience in the next 75 years. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you. I have my funding sources and some collaborators up here. Happy to take questions, I guess, at the end of the uh, talks. I'm going to see if I can do this without squeaking and making everybody tough. We're good. OK, I've done it. I've done it. All right. So thank you, Dr. Rivkin, for the amazing and extremely impactful research that you do. Um, so if anybody has questions for Dr. Rivkin, we'll save them for the end, write them down, and we will get to them, I promise. All right, next up, our next speaker is Dr. Jeremy Marty Dugas from the University of Waterloo. Uh, Dr. Marty Dugas is a McCall McBain alumni, and we're absolutely thrilled to have you back. So welcome back, Jeremy. Um, and I could not think of a better postdoc to present on the topic of enthusiasm. <laughs> this is 
definitely your domain. So I will allow you on that note to take it away. And I'm going to step over here, not to the windows, though. Is that part? Okay. Is that high enough to get the online audio too? Okay. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about lecturer enthusiasm and uh, attentional engagement in online lectures. So both the general public and educators subscribe to the belief that enthusiasm is an important quality for good teaching. Now, there's some evidence to support this, as a number of studies have found that students taught by an enthusiastic instructor tend to have a better memory for the lesson than taught by a non-enthusiastic instructor. However, there isn't a lot of research out there that has looked at how enthusiasm influences attention and engagement over time, right? And furthermore, most of the research, stay over here, I guess, most of the research is on um, an in-person interaction. So we've got it kind of half and half here. I, if I had thought of it on time, I would have had thought probes in my slides throughout and we could have done a live experiment for our online and in-person people. Um, but because video and online lectures are getting to be more and more popular, it's important to know how things like enthusiasm work in this kind of context. Uh, so um, a nice thing about online lectures, one of the good things, is that it means the lecture is always accessible, right? You can get it anytime, any place, anywhere. The downside is that inattention in lectures tends to be high already. It tends to increase over time. And both of these things tend to be more pronounced in an online or video context. So what we wanted to do with this study was look and see whether enthusiasm would influence people's attention and engagement in an online context, and to track the time course of attention over the length of an entire lecture. So uh, more formally, we asked, does instructor enthusiasm influence student engagement during an online, asynchronous online lecture? And does the effect, if any, change over time? Now, on the one hand, you might imagine that it only occurs in the latter half of the lecture when students' attention is more likely to lapse. But on the other hand, it could be that any effect of enthusiasm only happens at the beginning of the lecture when students are paying better attention and therefore notice that the lecturer is being enthusiastic. Uh, we also wanted to know about how this would impact memory performance, whether students taught by an enthusiastic instructor would have better memory for the lecture content. Now, both of these questions, what we did was in two different samples, we first explored the data in sample one, registered those analyses on the Open Science Foundation, and then conducted confirmatory analyses in a second sample. In that second sample, we also asked an additional question, which was, does instructor enthusiasm influence students' motivation to watch subsequent lectures? And we'll talk a little bit more about that one later on, but these are the three that we asked. What I want to do now is show you two brief clips uh, from our experiment that will give you an idea of what it was like to be a part of the experiment and give you a sense of how we manipulated enthusiasm. Now, I've been assured that this is not going to uh, be so loud that it brings the roof down on us, but uh, just in case, you know, you can cover your head. We'll see what happens. Oh, okay, it's a different story. We don't hear it at all. Well, it goes something like this. Organisms that live on the surface of... Oh, here it is. Organisms that live on the surface of this magnificent planet we call we'll Earth are exposed to environmental cycles that, that unfold over fixed periods of, of time. Magnificent planet we call Earth are exposed to environmental cycles that unfold over fixed periods of time. I can do a very good impression of that, but it really wouldn't have much of a payoff for everybody who's never heard it before. So uh, that's one. See if you can guess which one is the enthusiastic one. I'll play the second one here. Organisms that live on the surface of this organisms that live on the surface of this magnificent planet we call Earth are exposed to environmental cycles that unfold over fixed periods of time. Probably fairly apparent that that second one 
is the unenthusiastic lecture. It even feels longer to me just going through it. And I can tell you that it is the same length of time. I know that for a fact. So hopefully as well that gave you a good idea of what it was like to experience one of these lectures. So what we did was assign participants to one of two conditions, either the high enthusiasm or low enthusiasm condition. Um, now, the lecture had the exact same script and slides. Both had the voiceover delivery, sort of like you saw. So it was virtually identical other than the level of enthusiasm in the speaker's voice. Now, we also wanted to know about their attention and engagement throughout. So uh, what we did to assess that was give them thought probes intermittently throughout the lecture. Uh, so let's just take a closer look at that. Uh, beginning with what we had was a manipulation check, so asking people how enthusiastic or energetic they found the instructor. And then questions that assess engagement, like I was totally absorbed by the lecture or I found myself completely immersed in the lecture. Um, and we asked students to say how frequently they had these kinds of experiences. At the end of the lecture, in sample two, we added an additional question. And that was, how motivated are you to watch the next lecture? What we asked students to do was imagine the lecture they had just watched was part of a real online course that they were taking, and then to rate how motivated they would be to watch the next one, right? Especially for lots of courses that exist nowadays where you don't go to the lecture in a set hall at a set time, but you decide when you listen to it. That sort of thing is maybe something that's quite important. We also then assessed their memory with a quiz, which we did with uh, multiple choice items that were delivered at the end of everything else. Okay, so first one I'm gonna show you here is uh, data from our manipulation check. If we want to be able to make claims about how enthusiasm impacts people's attention and engagement, first we have to make sure that we actually impacted enthusiasm in the way that we meant to, right? That students found that there was a difference between our enthusiastic and non-enthusiastic lecture. Uh, so what you're gonna see first on the y-axis going up and down here is the ratings of lecturer enthusiasm, higher up being more enthusiastic and energetic. And along the x-axis uh, is time progressing in the linear fashion that we all usually experience. Uh, so what you can see here is that in both samples, there's a significant and large effect of lecturer enthusiasm, such that those in the high enthusiasm condition, which is the purple line up here, were finding the instructor to be significantly more enthusiastic and energetic than those in the low enthusiasm condition. All right, and so that means that we can be confident that our manipulation worked, right? Now, when we move on to our question of interest, we know that we are assessing the effect of enthusiasm. So now what I'm gonna show you is people's ratings of engagement or attention over the course of the lecture. Uh, now what's gonna be on the y-axis is those ratings of engagement, again, higher up, meaning that they were more engaged. And so here, what you can see across both samples is that there is a significant effect of enthusiasm such that those in the high enthusiasm condition are feeling far more engaged and attentive than those in the low enthusiasm condition. Furthermore, that effect is consistent over the course of the entire lecture, right? So they start off higher and they continue that way for most of the lecture from, from start to finish. And so this is good news because what this means is that even in an online context, being enthusiastic can lead to more engagement and attentiveness on the part of the students. So, we also wanted to know about memory. And I'll show you those as well. Quiz performance is how we assess memory, right? That was that 16 item multiple choice test. Again, higher up on the y-axis means better performance on the quiz. So, what you can see here, it looks like there's a little bit of a difference in sample one, but it's not actually a statistically significant effect in either of these samples. And this is sort of interesting because it means that that increased engagement that results from higher enthusiasm isn't actually translating into better memory for the lecture. Now, that could be because we assess them right afterwards. That's not usually what happens in a course is that you get quizzed right away. Uh, but that's a question for future research we're interested in. 
Okay, so lastly as well, we asked about motivation. So again, remember we asked them to imagine that the lecture they had just watched was part of a real online course and to rate how motivated they would be to watch the next lecture. And here we do see a significant effect and it's a fairly large one as well, which shows us that those who experienced a high enthusiasm lecture are feeling a lot more motivated and interested in watching that next one than those who are in the low enthusiasm condition. So, uh, to conclude here, what we found with this study is that students are significantly more engaged in the high enthusiasm lecture and they stay that way over the course of the entire lecture. But there's no evidence that that high enthusiasm and higher engagement is translating into better memory for the lecture content, at least when we measure them right afterwards. Finally as well, we saw that students in the high enthusiasm condition reported being far more motivated to watch the next lecture in the course. Now, in most real courses where there's a longer delay between the lecture and the test, and behaviors that require students to re-engage with the material, like studying on your own or virtually attending the next lecture, those behaviors are closely tied to how motivated they are, and they're also very closely tied to success in the course. And so what this study tells us is that enthusiasm, even in an online context, can continue to be a really useful tool because it leads to higher engagement and higher motivation for those students, even in that online context. Uh, and so with that, I just wish to thank these uh, collaborators and organizations and you for your attention, which hopefully has lasted throughout. <laughs> so great presentation, Dr. Marty Dugas. Uh, and much like Ferris Bueller, I don't think that I'm alone in reflecting upon my own academic career in some pretty monotonous, unenthusiastic, uh, you know, professors. So I really look forward to seeing what you publish in the future. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Uh, Mosem Nisemi uh, from the Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Nisemi is a transportation engineer with a focus on the safety of vulnerable road users. He has been using virtual reality applications extensively as a key research method to contribute to the advancement of transportation safety. Working in the world of VR is a, really no surprise that Dr. Nazemi admits to being, and I wrote the word love in all caps, in love, right? Uh, with Apple's new wireless VR headset. And as you see his presentation, you're going to see why, I promise you. So without further ado, I allow you to take it away, Dr. Nazemi. Thank you very much. Okay, is this working? Good. Great. My name is Mohsen Nazemi. I got my PhD in transportation engineering from ETH Zurich. Currently, I'm a postdoc researcher at Toronto Metropolitan University in the Laboratory of Innovations in Transportation. Today, I'm not going to only talk about my PhD, but my postdoc research, but also the challenges that I face and I had to overcome to be able to conduct my research. Since 2016, my research has been at the intersection of transportation engineering, psychophysiology, and human behavior. I have been using virtual reality since then because virtual reality makes impossible possible for me. This is my PhD research actually. I was studying cycling safety at that time using a virtual reality bicycle simulator combined with a physiological sensor. We used to invite participants to come to our laboratory. They were invited to sit on this bicycle. The bicycle was fixed on a bicycle stand. They were wearing the goggles. There was a sensor connected to their hand, which was measuring their electrodermal activity as an indicator of their, their stress level. And they were riding through different bicycle facilities in VR. So we could measure their behavior and their stress level in diff under different conditions. Very important characteristic of this setup was that it was a stationary. Participants were not supposed to walk in the room with the VR. Very hard task. For my postdoc research, if you know that autonomous vehicles are coming to our roads, but they also bring new challenges for us, especially for pedestrians. Pedestrians are used to have eye contact when they want to cross a street, especially at unsignalized intersections. However, autonomous vehicles, they don't have any driver, so there is no eye contact. This might create new challenges. 
That's why some autonomous vehicle factories are creating external human machine interfaces uh, to just enable the participants to know about the decision of the AV. So what we wanted to understand here in this research was that does pedestrian behavior change in the presence of AV, especially about the stress level of the pedestrians? Again, we use virtual reality combined with galvanic skin response uh, uh, sensor, which measures the electrodermal activity, again, as an indicator of the stress level of the pedestrians. Since this was a joint collaboration between Toronto Metropolitan University and uh, Newcastle University in the UK, we selected two locations, one in Toronto, one in Newcastle. The Union Station was simulated in VR, and then we defined an experiment task. In our experiment, participants start by standing on a sidewalk. They are supposed to go to the yellow tactile pavement on, this, on the sidewalk. They have to find a suitable and safe moment to cross the street. They have to cross the street multiple times under different experimental manipulations. As you can see in the illustration on the left, this setup needs a large space to be able to conduct this research. And this time, participants have to walk in the room while wearing the goggle. Very challenging. But the virtual reality equipment originally comes with two base stations. They are usually installed at the corners of the room, and they track the movement of the head-mounted display. That's how you are enabled to actually move in VR. But they can only cover a 5 meter by 5 meter area, and we need it at approximately 10 meter by 10 meter. Then we say, OK, we just add two more base stations, we expand the play area, and by that we have solved the issue. So we also needed to extend the original cables that are connected to the head-mounted display. Now, we, at this stage, we were, we were thinking that, okay, we are ready to conduct the experiment. Very excited. Now, let's see what happened. The extended cable had issues. This is the very first pilot participant. In multiple cases, the wires were just tangling, so very difficult to just take care of that. The participant also was supposed to take care of the wires and be careful with that while wearing the goggle, which was almost a, an impossible task. Me, as the researcher, I had to take care of the wire and this was only one round. So the participant was supposed to go multiple rounds. Now you see what happened in another round. Again, I almost tripped on the wire. At the end of the first pilot participant, I realized that, okay, this is completely a failure. I cannot do this. I have to come up with a new design. That's how I thought of this new ceiling pulley system. We use a flexible curtain track. We use track rollers, ceiling brackets, and zip ties to create this system because, of course, we were not also allowed to drill any holes in the ceiling, another limitation, but we managed to do it with zip ties. As you can see in the video, I was freely moving in the room while wearing the goggles. At least for the straight line, it was working perfectly. Then again here, I said, okay, now I'm ready to conduct my research. Great job. Let's see what happened next. This is the very next pilot participant while creating the turn. Since we had loose connections to the ceiling, this happened, actually. Almost the whole ceiling pulley system fell down, which was, again, a complete failure. So we had to actually enhance these connections to the ceiling, and we did that. Again, with the next pilot participant, he actually turned a bit sooner than expected, <laughs> so his head was dragged back because of con uh, this wire connected to the head-mounted display. So we had to fix all these uh, small issues to be able to conduct the, re the research. In the final setup, we managed to have two different setups next to each other, just to speed up the data collection because we had lost a lot of time. But at least we could freely move around the room with the head-mounted display on and then without the need of the help of anybody else. So this was great achievement. And then finally, we were able to conduct the research with our main participants. This is one of the main participants, and some interesting things happened. This is the view, participant's view. On the top left, you can see the white box, which, show, which shows the online stress level of the participant. So you can see how the stress level has been increased at this moment compared to the previous moments. 
Of course, in reality, we were never able to get permissions from the ethics committee to conduct such research. Thanks to VR, we were able to do that. This is the exact part of the signal that you saw in the previous video. Uh, after applying some signal processing techniques, we were able to identify the stressful moments. Those are the dots on the uh, actually line that you can see. We were also able to uh, estimate the amplitude of each of these stressful moments. So for example, here you can see the incurred stress due to the risk of having an accident. That's how big it is. Uh, but on top of all of this, we were able to measure the stress of the participants when they were dealing with autonomous vehicles versus just normal vehicles. And that was, that was the main goal of this research. At the end of the day, we managed to complete the experiment with 51 pilot participants, 113 main participants, and in total, 164 participants. This hectic data collection took more than two years to complete. And of course, we had to observe all the uh, COVID-19 safety protocols. We distributed more than 7,000 Amazon gift cards just for compensation to participate in our research. For concluding remarks, this study involved one of the most complicated VR data collection processes. We initially considered using wireless VR headsets, but we had to make a compromise on the quality, and that was certainly not desired uh, for us. We developed a ceiling pulley system tailored for ambulatory VR setups, which is, by the way, completely outdated after the, uh, uh, after the introduction of this Apple Vision Pro, which is wireless, high quality, amazing. So <laughs> there is no use for our ceiling pulley system anymore. The resulting data set stands among the world's largest and most reliable data sets of virtual reality combined with physiological sensors. And please stay tuned for our forthcoming paper on quantifying pedestrian stress level during the street crossings in the presence of AVs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nizemi, for such an interesting talk. I can really see why wireless Apple VR sets are your favorite. It makes sense now. Our fourth speaker of the evening is Dr. Derek Somo from McMaster University. Dr. Somo holds a PhD in zoology with a focus on metabolic and respiratory aspects of adaptation in fish to the temperature and oxygen variability characteristic of the intertidal environment. Try saying that five times fast, right? Uh, his research here at Mac investigates uh, another really resilient and interesting creature, the mouse. Uh, when Dr. Somo gets a very rare chance to step away from the lab, he likes to unwind with an evening of Argentine tango. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tango. I mean, Somo. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Uh, so my main goal this evening uh, is to focus less on the specifics of my research and more to introduce you to uh, the field that I work in, comparative physiology. You know, I'm from the States, and in the US, the National Science Foundation funds a lot of the basic research that happens in the country. Um, and of course, you know, we have a responsibility to the public because it's publicly funded science to explain why we do what we do with the funding that we get. And this is particularly important back home because there's sort of these, you know, it's, it's, it's government, right? So there's these hearings that happen and, you know, people get dragged up from the National Science Foundation governing body and they get put in front of senators and they say, why the heck are we using taxpayer funding for you to exercise shrimp on treadmills? <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's, that's a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation. And so, you know, mostly what I'm hoping to do tonight is to explain that, you know, yeah, actually, we should be exercising shrimp on treadmills. Uh, so over the course of my career, I've been very fortunate to work with a number of incredible species. During my masters, I worked with uh, northern elephant seals on the coast of California. Uh, during my PhD, as Katie mentioned, I worked with uh, fish that live in tide pools on the coast of BC. And here at the Master University, I'm studying the physiology of mice, deer mice, that live at the top of the Rocky Mountains. And of course, uh, these animals are all incredible in their own right and in many ways. But the aspect of their uh, biology that most fascinates me is their ability to deal with low oxygen conditions. OK, what's the deal with oxygen? We, we have this intuitive understanding that oxygen matters. Um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, the reason oxygen matters is because we use, animals use, uh, and plants for that matter, they combine oxygen with uh, fuels that we take up in our food 
And we burn that fuel uh, to provide energy for powering all of the critical functions we need to live, right? So things like nerve function, muscle contraction, digestion, lots of these processes that happen, they require the uh, burning of our food fuels with oxygen. We also kind of intuitively understand that uh, the amount of energy we require, and therefore the amount of oxygen we require, can vary depending on conditions. So for example, if we go from sort of a steady walk and then start sprinting, we're gonna need a lot more energy to power that increase in muscle contraction. So uh, we're gonna need to you know, release more energy. That means we're gonna have to burn more fuel with more oxygen. Okay, so what happens if we start moving in the other direction, right? Maybe if you can imagine yourself in a resting you know, condition, maybe you're laying down on the bed, uh, you're not doing anything, you're not digesting, you're not moving around, you're really trying to minimize the amount of energy you need. You still need to take up oxygen, you still need to burn fuels, right? So you've got this minimum level of energy you need to spend and minimum level of oxygen you need to consume just to stay alive. But what happens if oxygen starts to decrease in the environment? And not just in the environment, but just to kind of bring things home in a human health context, this is the kind of thing that can happen sort of locally in a particular organ with something like a heart attack. A part of your heart loses access to blood flow and therefore loses access to oxygen, and the cells in that part of the heart can die, and that can compromise heart function. Same thing with stroke. You lose oxygen and access to oxygen in the brain, and of course we're all very familiar with the effects of COVID uh, which can attack blood vessels and therefore the ability of tissues to receive uh, oxygen. So if we start to fall below those levels uh, of oxygen required to support that minimum level of function, that can compromise the energy we can produce and threaten our ability to maintain these critical uh, functions that support life. And, you know, I'm here because I study physiology, not because I'm an artist, but you understand that this can threaten, uh, this could be life-threatening. But of course, there are organisms that are adapted to low oxygen conditions, so they've uh, sort of solved this question of how do you keep life going under oxygen-limiting conditions. So of course, the seals were interesting because they spend 90% of their lives submerged, breath-holding, while they're diving. And they're doing everything they need to do. They hunt, they reproduce, they do all those things with very limited oxygen uh, during those dives. These tide pool sculpins live in pools that, while they're immersed from the ocean, especially in summertime conditions uh, during the evening, everything that's living in those pools can suck up the oxygen out of that water and really threaten the ability of these organisms to produce energy using oxygen. These fish have figured it out. And of course, at the top of the Rocky Mountains, we've got a decrease in atmospheric pressure that also decreases the availability of oxygen. And uh, these mice not only have to deal with a low oxygen condition, but as small mammals, they have to generate huge amounts of energy to keep themselves warm. And they're able to do that at the top of the Rocky Mountains. So they've also solved this low oxygen challenge. Hey. Okay. So it's all well and good that fish, mice, and seals have solved these low oxygen challenges. But you might be wondering, what does this have to do with anything we might care about as people? So setting aside sort of the academic uh, value of understanding how these animals have adapted to low oxygen, there are implications for things like human health. And this is because across these species, there's actually an incredible unity uh, across the diversity of life. So, you know, fish and mammals are separated by about 400 million years of evolution. Whoop. Uh, but despite that evolutionary separation, uh, they still need to keep this process going. They still need to eat, they still need to burn uh, the food that they've eaten using oxygen to produce energy to keep living. And, you know, I've hidden quite a bit of, of biology in these arrows. <laughs> but if we were to take a cell, let's say from a mussel, from this fish, this mouse, and this seal, if you were just looking at that cell, you wouldn't be able to tell uh, whether that cell was from a fish, a seal, or a mouse. And that's because the same structures that exist in a fish muscle cell are also present in these other species. 
This is true also for the biochemical pathways that support the function of those structures at the cell level. And so really, especially at the level of the cell, there's this incredible uni unity in how life works. And if we understand adaptation at this level, then that might help us understand how we can solve some of the challenges that we face in a human health context. And just to very briefly mention some of the stuff I'm doing here at McMaster with these deer mice, uh, most of the work I've done over the course of my career has been to think about how these animals have solved the problem of low oxygen. Um, but here at McMaster, I'm also really interested in this idea of how they're matching the delivery of fuel to uh, match the level of oxygen that's available. And you know, the analogy I like to think of, it, it's, it's a bit of a dated analogy because you know, uh, most engines don't have carburetors anymore and this is less, less of an issue. Uh, but in order for cars to work, in order for uh, your car to be able to burn the fuel inside of it and produce force to move the car forward, you actually have to have a very precise delivery of the amount of fuel relative to the amount of oxygen that's injected in order to get that fuel to explode and to produce mo movement. And there's actually a sort of similar uh, nature to the challenge that these organisms face when oxygen varies, uh, both within a particular tissue and across their body to ensure that they're matching fuel delivery to the oxygen they're able to consume. And this has important implications uh, for uh, aspects of metabolic health in humans. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you that uh, comparative physiology offers an opportunity to learn from species that have solved these problems we really care about, and that, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we probably should be exercising shrimp on treadmills. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Somo. It looks like you get to work with some pretty cool creatures. Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Johnson from the University of Toronto. Dr. Johnson is a clinician scientist and has been a clinician in pediatric palliative care for the past decade. Her research is informed by her clinical practice experiences and aims to advance the palliative care of children and adolescents living with serious illness or advanced disease. Dr. Johnson actually never intended uh, to do a PhD, but upon hearing an adolescent patient yell loudly that no one understood her experiences, she knew that there was a lot to learn about how to best care for adolescents with cancer. That patient's yelling put her on her path for her current research. When she's not thinking about her research, she's trying to keep up with her very excited five-year-old who lives for fun and adventure. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Andrea Johnson. Hi, everyone. It's really a privilege to be with you tonight and to share with you a little bit about my research regarding understanding and measuring quality of life for adolescents living with advanced cancer. So let's take a moment and go back in time and back to being an adolescent. What were your hopes, your goals? What mattered to you? These are the questions that fuel my postdoctoral research, but with adolescents living with advanced cancer. So this is cancer that is difficult to treat and difficult to cure. What's important to this group of adolescents when living with advancing disease? Adolescents with cancer are globally considered a distinct cancer patient population. They have lower rates of survival compared to both children and adults diagnosed with cancer. And many adolescents experience significant psychosocial challenges following a diagnosis of cancer due to this very complex intersection between their physical and psychosocial development with a diagnosis of a life-threatening disease. And this intersection creates many complex and numerous needs for this patient group that adolescents report often remain unmet by healthcare providers. And so for all of these reasons, this patient population is considered to be one of significant, with significant vulnerabilities. If their cancer becomes advanced, when they're living with cancer that's difficult to cure, 
these vulnerabilities become exasperated. Sadly, up to 40% of adolescents diagnosed with cancer will not survive their cancer diagnosis and will live with advanced cancer. This means that a significant number of adolescents will access palliative care. Palliative care is specialized health care designed to enhance their quality of life. Despite the vulnerabilities of this patient population, though, there are significant gaps in their palliative care. And as a clinician myself in pediatric palliative care, I've been actively confronted by, by these gaps. Specifically, enhancing quality of life is a dominant goal of palliative care, yet wet quality of life looks like, what it means for this population of adolescents has been underexplored. And without knowing what quality of life means for this group of young people, it's very difficult to know how to enhance it as a clinician. So my research is really centered around quality of life. Uh, there are many definitions of quality of life, but one that's commonly invoked is from the World Health Organization and states, quality of life is an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value systems in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. So my postdoctoral research is really focused on developing a, a, a definition of quality of life and understanding of quality of life for this population of adolescents and then developing a way to measure their quality of life. And so specifically, I'm creating a conceptual framework, um, so really just a comprehensive conceptual definition of quality of life, of what um, offers meaning and what's important to adolescents living with advanced disease, and then taking this conceptual framework to inform the development of a patient-reported outcome measure, a PROM for short, which is just a certain kind of questionnaire that we give to patients in practice that would validly and meaningful assess their, their quality of life. So at the start of my research, I went to the literature and was curious how quality of life had been defined and conceptualized for this group of patients. And I had a couple of really important realizations. So the first was that quality of life hadn't been defined or conceptualized specifically for this group of adolescents. So this really confirmed that we really didn't know what was meaningful and important to this group of adolescents as they live with advancing cancer. The second realization I had was that any developed, develop, developing of a conceptual framework or definition of quality of life for this specific patient group really needed to be informed by their voices and perspectives and not by the voices and perspectives of their healthcare providers and their parents, which is often how quality of life is reported in the research and in clinical practice. And again, if we think back to being an adolescent, I'm sure we can appreciate that our parents probably don't have the fullest sense of our experience. Due to the absence of the representation of adolescents' voices in quality of life research, I also created a patient advisory group, which is a group of adolescents and young adults treated for cancer who will accompany th me throughout this research and to ensure that the voices of adolescents remain at the forefront of this research. So then to really formally begin to think about how adolescents living with advanced cancer might understand and describe their quality of life, we conducted a really innovative study using social media, primarily TikTok videos, as research data. So to be eligible for inclusion in this study, social media content had to, had to be created by adolescents ages 13 to 19 years old. Posts had to, or the authors of these posts, had to communicate in some way that they were living with advanced cancer, their terminal cancer, or had multiple relapses for cancer. And finally, that the post, the social media post, had to reflect something important or meaningful in their life. It could be positive or negative, but something important about their life while living with advanced cancer. And we were really surprised by the raw and open experiences that adolescents described living with advanced cancer that they posted to their social media accounts. And we were able to collect 335 social media um, posts for uh, the analysis of this study. So this research led to our proposed, develop, proposed concepts of quality of life that we believe are relevant and meaningful to adolescents living with advanced cancer. So you can see them here, health, the lived body, emotional well-being, uh, purpose and direction, and reorientation. 
And these concepts of quality of life are different from those concepts of quality of life that are often applied to adolescents with cancer, but that haven't been created by their voices and perspectives. So for example, the PEDS-QL is a very common measurement model of quality of life used in healthcare with adolescents. And you can see the concepts here, physical functioning, emotional functioning, social functioning, and school functioning. Another very common or conceptual framework that's thought to commonly underlie most quality of life instruments used with this population or used with adolescents with cancer um, has the following concepts of quality of life, physical, psychological, social, and general health. Although the differences between our concepts, our proposed concepts of quality of life, and the concepts in the conceptual frameworks that I've just shown you seem slight, in clinical practice, they're large. These concepts highlight to clinicians, signal to them what they should pay attention to in the clinical care of this population of young people. Developing concepts of quality of life directly from their voices helps us to make sure that we pay attention to what's actually important to adolescents living with advanced cancer. For example, in the PEDS-QL, you can see the concept of phys physical functioning and how well the body functions. And whereas our concept of the lived body is a reflection of that, but, that, but it, it is different. It really reflects the subjective experience of living in a sick body that we heard a lot from adolescents posting on their social media. Next steps of this research are to validate these concepts of quality of life and develop a conceptual framework. We will then use this conceptual framework to develop items for our newly developed PROM. We'll validate these items, and then we'll conduct initial testing of this PROM. Each step of this research will be done with adolescents living with advanced cancer, and we're involving adolescents in pediatric oncology and pediatric palliative pro care programs throughout Canada. There really is a pressing need to develop a meaningful, conceptual definition of quality of life and a meaningful and relevant way to measure it. As I mentioned at the start of my talk, there are significant gaps in the palliative care of this very vulnerable group of young people. They are a very, very clinically complex patient population to care for as a clinician. And we stumble and bumble with them often because we don't understand what they need and how best to meet their needs. It's really our hope with this research that we'll equip clinicians in pediatric oncology and pediatric palliative care to really begin to think about what quality of life means to adolescents living with advanced cancer and then work with adolescents to enhance their quality of life while they're living with cancer that's unlikely to be cured. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Your work is truly inspiring. Our final speaker of the evening is Dr. Lindsay Santicroce from the Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Santicroce works in the Memory and Decision Process Lab, where her research interests broadly include attentional capture, the interactions between goal-driven and stimulus-driven attention, emotion, motivation, and age-related differences. When she can step away from the lab, Dr. Santa Croce is likely listening to Hozier, you know that take it to church, church guy, we all know, yes? Uh, she admits to being a huge mega fan and has already seen him seven times live and is going an additional two times this year. He may even make an appearance in this slideshow, so keep your eyes peeled, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, hi everyone. Today I'm going to be explaining to you what the EAB is, or the Emotional Attentional Blink, and why I think it's actually a pop-out blink. We live in a world in which we are constantly being bombarded by a mass amount of visual information, and we have to attend to what is important while ignoring distractors. For example, while driving, we are able to pay attention to the other cars on the road and the street signs because they are important to our current task, which is driving. On the other hand, we're able to ignore the birds flying overhead and the billboards on the side of the road because they are currently irrelevant. So now I'm gonna give you a demo of um, how we study this kind of goal-driven attention in the lab. So you're going to see a bunch of rapidly flashing images and one of those images is gonna be of a fruit. 
I want you guys to try to find and remember what fruit you see, okay? Ready? Okay, what fruit did you see? Orange, good, you saw an orange. That was an example of a rapid serial visual presentation or an RSVP task, which is how we study goal-driven temporal attention or t attention across time. So in the RSVP task, we have a number of rapidly flashing filler items, and then we have a target item. So in the demo, that the fillers were the objects, and then the target was the fruit. So when you saw the stream of images, you were able to detect and select the orange as a target, and then your brain had to take the time to process it so that you can accurately report it at the end of the trial. And we humans are very good at this. Most, if not all of you, were able to accurately report seeing an orange, even though I only presented those images for 50 milliseconds each. So this shows how quick and efficient our goal-driven attention is. However, sometimes highly salient information that is currently irrelevant to our current goals can capture our attention. This can sometimes be a good thing, such as when a dog unexpectedly runs out in front of your car while you're driving. It might capture your attention, and so then you're able to react accordingly. However, this can also be dangerous such as when an accident on the side of the road captures your attention away from the road, and then you cause another accident. So it's important to understand how and why our attention is captured. So now I'm gonna show another demo um, of how we study attentional capture in the lab. You're again going to see flashing images and one will be of a fruit, okay? Okay, what fruit did you see? Good, you saw kiwis or Perhaps you actually missed that one. Did you happen to notice the disturbing image that was also present in the stream? Did that maybe capture your attention? Well, in general, emotional stimuli tend to capture your attention even at the expense of current goals. And so emotion, emotional stimuli are often used to study this kind of attentional capture. And the reason you were most more likely to miss uh, the target in that last demo was because of something known as the emotional attentional blink or the EAB. This isn't a real blink, but it's a lapse in our attention that's caused by attentional capture from an emotional stimulus that draws resources away from a target. So the RSVP task we use for EAB paradigms is the same one that I showed you earlier, but now there's also an emotional distractor that precedes the target, and then there's a varying amount of filler items that separate the two items. So the idea is that when you're seeing the stream of images, the emotional image, even though it is task irrelevant, you're supposed to be ignoring it, it nonetheless captures your attention and you select it, even though it's not a target, you select it as an important item and then your brain takes the time to process it. So then if the target appears shortly after, like here at lag two, when the target is two spots away from the emotional distractor, you're still busy processing the distractor, so you can't select or process the target and are wondering what the target is at the end of the trial. However, if you increase the number of filler items between the two items, like here at lag four, when the Kiwi is four spots away from the emotional distractor, even though that emotional image will still capture your attention, forcing you to select and process it, you've now fully processed uh, that image so you're still, you're now able to select and process the target as well and are able to accurately report. So to look at that graphically, on the x-axis we have lag or the position of the target relative to the emotional distractor and on the y-axis we have accuracy. When the emotional distractor and the target are close in temporal proximity, like at lag two, which is what you guys did in the demo, you can see participants perform very poorly. However, as lag increases, so does performance. So this shape here is the classic blink shape. So now that I've explained what the emotional attentional blink is, now I'm going to tell you why I don't actually believe it. First, let's look at previous EAB paradigms. The original and still the most common uses streams of landscapes and uh, landscapes as the fillers and the targets. And this other one uses objects as the fillers and the targets. And in these and other similar paradigms, they often use emotional humans or animals as the emotional distractors. 
And with these and similar paradigms, the EAB has been shown many times before and is widely accepted as an intentional capture caused by emotion. However, I noticed something about these paradigms. The emotional distractor is always visually distinct from the surrounding stimuli. So we have humans or animals among landscapes or objects. Of note, these uh, experiments often also have neutral conditions with neutral images of humans or animals in the same streams, which are also visually distinct from the surrounding stimuli. And while the attentional capture from emotion in the EAB paradigms is very, very strong, when these studies often have these neutral conditions, you'll often see a weaker neutral blink, which is interesting. I'd also like to point out that in the demo we did earlier, this is actually what you saw. So really, I cheated and made the emotional distractor much brighter than the rest of the images. So what was really capturing your attention? Was it really the emotional blink, or was it more of a pop-out blink caused by visual distinctiveness? Which leads me to my research, where I explored this idea of a pop-out blink. First, I wanted to see if I can even observe an EAB in the absence of visual distinctiveness. So I conducted a study with four experiments. Two of them were common and uh, very similar to the previous paradigms I talked about, in which the critical distractors, the emotional distractors, were visually distinct from the surrounding stimuli. And with these, I did find the expected EAB effects. More importantly, experiment three used streams of images that could come from any category, so the fillers, the targets and the emotional distractors could be animals, humans, buildings, food, objects, anything. And then in my experiment four, I used streams of all words. So in these two paradigms, the emotional distractor were visually similar to the surrounding stimuli. And if emotion alone is enough to capture our attention, I should still see the EAB effect. However, that is not the case. I couldn't even find it at all. So it seems that the emotional blink that is assumed to be captured by emotion is likely more of a pop-out blink. It's more likely that the distinctiveness is what's capturing our attention, and then emotion might prolong that capture. So in order to see if this was the case, I conducted another experiment to look at the uh, precise time courses of the blinks caused by distinctiveness, emotion. So in order to do this, I used the paradigm that we did uh, earlier in the demo, and I manipulated the uh, distractor's visual distinctiveness, so we have visually similar or distinct, and it's valence, so we have baseline or emotional. In the baseline similar condition, or the true baseline condition, the distractor was just another uh, item that looked like every other item in the stream. And then the emotional condition, we used unpleasant humans. What's important is in the visually distinct conditions, we made the images appear brighter than the rest of the stimuli, which is like what you did in the demo. And then because I was interested in seeing how long or exactly when your attention is captured by emotion and visual distinctiveness, I needed to be very uh, sensitive to the time course. So in order to do that, I compared each of the condition to the true baseline condition at each individual lag so that I can determine the precise start, end, and duration of each blink. And by doing this, I was able to observe the exact time courses of the blinks caused by just emotion, just visual distinctiveness, and both. So first, in the blink that was caused just by emotion, it began kind of late, around lag three, and lasted two lags. Then the blink uh, that was caused by just visual distinctiveness without emotion, that blink began right away at lag one and also lasted about two lags. But what's interesting is when you merge the blink time courses from both of these, you get the time course of the blink that I observed in the emotional distinct condition. So this supports my hypothesis that really the EAB is initially caused by the pop-out effect 
from visual distinctiveness, and then emotion plays a role later on and extends that. So going back to the driving example one more time, think about how cars that are important try to make themselves known on the road. They'll often use lights. So if you see the bright lights on a taxi, it'll likely capture your attention, but it's a pretty neutral vehicle, so you'll likely disengage very quickly. However, if those lights instead belong to a police car, those lights will capture your attention, but you might focus on it for a little bit longer because of its emotional valence. But at the same time, if it was an undercover police car without the lights, it might not capture your attention even though it still has this emotional valence, just like the marked police car. But it looks like every other car on the road, so it won't have this pop-out effect. And my research supports this idea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santa Croce. What a fascinating subject. And I did catch the guest appearance. Did any of you? Hopefully, yeah. Joe actually turned to me and goes, who is Hozier? Joe. All right, at this point in the evening, I will open up the floor to some questions uh, from our audience, as well as our online audience. So if you're online, please type your questions into the chat. If you happen to be live with us, you can simply raise your hand and Joe will come over with a microphone. We have a question online. This is for our last speaker. So if the oranges were not orange, would we have noticed them as easily? That's actually, Lindsay, pull it up. <laughs> That's actually a great question because um, participants, I've learned that they really like to use semantic processing as much as humanly possible. Um, so yeah, when they are the colors of fruits, so like greens, reds, a lot of the times those will capture attention because you build like an attentional set in your head. So like you're looking out for these specific features. So when you see these features, they will capture your attention. So yes, that is a very valid point. And when I was picking the images to use as the filler items, I was trying to be very careful to make sure I used images that matched the same colors as fruits. So I tried to have like brighter colors instead of just neutral images as the filler items. So I did try to correct for that, but yes, that is true that those would capture your attention. Thank you. And I just wanted to remind everybody as well, during this period, you can log on to the QR code here and vote for your favorite talks. So ensure that you do that now, vote for your favorites, make sure they get your vote uh, because they will win a prize at the end of this evening. All right. Thank you. Dr. Somo, um, just wondering if you have any uh, knowledge of research that is done on free divers and whether their cells are different um, than the rest of us or if they show diversity or even similarity with any of these other um, cells that you examine. Is there any kind of parallel? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. And I would say <clears throat> there's kind of two parts to this. So the first is, and you can imagine this is true for lots of different types of human performance. There are people who are gifted uh, and there are people who train well. And both of those contribute to free diver performance. So it's not necessarily that uh, the free divers intrinsically have, uh, you know, the, the structures are the same. So they still have all the same structures you would have in any you know, animal cell, um, but the expression of di different amounts of things like mitochondria and enzyme levels uh, will differ based on uh, a free diver's sort of genetic giftedness, I would call it, uh, as well as the training that they do to enhance their ability uh, to stay underwater and really eke out as much of that oxygen as they can use and reduce how fast they're using it to improve their free diving performance. I don't know if that answers the question, but okay, yeah, thanks. All right, any other questions? I have a question for uh, Dr. Rifkin. Dr. 
So I know you've been focusing on the apex predator, the, the polar bear, but when you're looking at adaptation to um, the, uh, the, the uh, melting ice, how does, um, how does it compare for their predators? Like for the seal, how fast are they adapting to the same conditions? Uh, that's uh, something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I, as far as I know, people have not really been looking at genetic adaptation of many Arctic mammals, and that includes seals. Um, this is be with the advent of whole genome sequencing. It's getting cheaper to figure out what DNA sequences are uh, adapting or not. Um, it's getting cheaper to do this, but it still hasn't really been studied. I would say evolution in the Arctic is very understudied. Um, so I can't answer your question, but I, I do think that it's worth investigating more. I would like to uh, ask a question to Jeremy Martin Dugas, if I could. <laughs> it's me. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, so my question is, as uh, the first one, is topic uh, has some influence? Like, and the next next question is. Uh, could the lecture be over enthusiastic and what is it? Yeah, both, both good questions. Um, so we haven't specifically looked uh, at whether the topic has an interaction with enthusiasm. Certainly you can imagine that if somebody's really interested in something, that even a boring speaker, they're probably going to be able to latch on to something and find some way to you know, still be engaged and interested. Uh, and, and conversely, you can find the same thing. Um, you know, I wasn't particularly interested in cognitive psychology when I signed up for the first course, but we had a good instructor and, you know, look how that turned out. Um, for your, your second question, um, thinking about, well, you can quickly remind me, it's the, my working memory is not as, not long enough. What was your second question? Over enthusiasm, yeah. So, um, certainly, if, if I delivered that, that talk by being like, the Y axis, you know, you, you would be completely distracted by the, the movements and things like that, right? Um, and there is some, there's some evidence that sort of is, is conflicting about whether teachers fake the enthusiasm. It still kind of works for students, so they don't really have to be enthusiastic themselves. It can be a false enthusiasm and students will still sort of have um, a better response but yeah if it's if it's really wildly over the top um, then you're going to be probably too distracting at that point you know yeah great questions all right maybe we can take one or two more and again, do not forget to vote. The votes are coming in. So if you see me sneak away behind the, uh, the curtain here, that's what I'm doing. Um, thank you all for um, such a wonderful night, actually. And my question is to Dr. Andrea Johnson. Um, hello. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering if you could talk uh, or, or share what are your challenges when you are applying your research with the IRB institution? Because there are so many gaps um, around the qualitative research. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Such an important and very relevant question to the, where I'm immersed right now in the, the process of my research. Um, maybe to contextualize that before I offer a response is, that's why we decided to use social media as the first step of kind of creating this hypothesized conceptual framework because this population is very difficult to access and difficult to recruit in research. Um, so that's why we had to be creative with how we could access their voices and perspectives. Um, and the, the REB is, is, is very challenging and there's certainly um, a culture of 
paternalism and protectionism um, that really excludes children and adolescents from research, and especially in qualitative research where you know, it's likely that children and adolescents will be disclosing and discussing distressing things. This seems almost far too difficult for an REB to imagine that we have to, and so as a result, we have to really clamp down on qualitative research with this population to avoid them from being distressed. Um, what I learned, my dissertation, my PhD research was on a similar topic, um, and what I learned from this population is that they really do want to be involved in research, and they do want their voices to be used to help and support other adolescents diagnosed with cancer. Um, and there's also a lot of research showing that parent proxies and healthcare provider proxies are not aligned with the data that adolescents would give themselves. So, I, yeah, it's so challenging. I have a stuck application in the REB at SickKids currently. Um, very challenging and just trying to kind of find creative ways to get data, but also really trying to construct a solid argument that why it's important to have the voices of this population qualitatively in research. But such a good question and, and such a difficult problem. Yeah, thank you. One last question for uh, Dr. Dazemi. So, um, what I love about your research is that you combine many different things, looking at engineering, looking at physiology, looking at humans, and humans are very complicated. <laughs> so uh, my question for you is that one of the things I noticed in the video, um, just the behavior of the, that participant, you know, she was walking and like, oh, I'm supposed to look both ways. And so uh, my question for you is, how do you think people's behavior compares in a virtual situation where they're confronted with danger versus a real life situation? Thank you very much for the question. This is actually a very important point with all the research about virtual reality. At the end of the day, many people say that this is not valid because this, is, this has not done in the reality. Uh, basically, we don't have any comparison that we can do in reality. So the, the answer to the question is that if we have some, some situation in reality that is comparable to the virtual reality scenario, I can totally tell you that, okay, this is this much difference between the two. This is the best uh, we can go so at far, I mean, by far, but hopefully in the future when the AVs are really in the, uh, on the streets, for example, we can create similar scenarios and compare the behavior of the people in VR to the reality. All right, the votes have been tallied, they are in. So what I'm gonna do now is ask our speakers to come up to the front for a final round of applause. All right, so now that everything's been tallied, I just wanted to say before I announce the winner, uh, and we've given a final round of applause. I just want to let our researchers know that you are actually conducting some amazing work that will one day change our world. Thank you for all that you do, whether it be understanding animal adaptations or pedestrian behavior, uh, enlightening teaching and learning practices, or understanding the needs of vulnerable populations. Postdoctoral researchers drive our understanding of the world. As a thank you, each finalist this evening will receive an award created by local artist Paul Rodrigue from Dundas, Ontario, just 10 minutes away. Um, he's created these glass pieces to look like a flame. And I gave him the task to create it specifically for McMaster, so it's infused with the knowledgeable colors of McMaster University. And he said he wanted to create a flame because for him, um, the symbol of fire and fire burning brightly, brightly lighting the way, uh, is very indicative of what our postdocs do for us each and every day when they step in the lab. All right. Um, so now, without further delay, the winner of the McCall McBain 10 Minute Research Talks is Lindsay Santa Croce. A round of applause, everybody. All right. So Lindsay will receive a cash prize today. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. I hope you've learned a thing or two. I know that I certainly have. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody who made this night possible. The McCall McBain Foundation for believing in the researchers and leaders of tomorrow. To the McMaster Office of Alumni Engagement. To our amazing researchers, of course. And to all of you for joining us here in person as well as online. Have a safe drive home. Thank you.